this Thomas model used linear drug, bottom linear drug, in order to balance the input of elasticity by the. Uh, so I have to do what? That here. That's it. And um, okay. So Stommel added bottom linear drag to balance the input of vorticity by the Winstress curl. Should I close this slide? Let me see. And so we saw the different solutions with the Stommel model. And uh, let me see. So we saw that from the uh, interiors by the transfer, we needed to choose a boundary current to balance this vector transport towards the equator. In this case, there could be two possible solutions, west and east, mathematically both valid, only one physically valid. But actually, even you probably know the PV arguments that why the western boundary should be in the west. But even without talking about PV conservation, we saw that the boundary current, the return flow, had to be in the west okay, in order to match this verge of interior transport through the matching asymptotics that we did. Okay, so we ended up with, so only one of the two possible solutions here was decaying towards the interior, which is this one, and so we had to match the return flow on the west. And by doing that, we arrived at this, okay, so this is the standard problem with the rotating Earth, spherical Earth, where F varies with latitude, so there is beta. If beta uh, is zero, so there is no differential rotation, imagine the Earth is just a disk rotating, not, not a sphere, then you have F is a constant, you're on the F plane, F equal F naught, and so you have um, symmetrical gyres, okay? There is no there is no uh, need for a western boundary current that balances the input of vorticity by the wind because this term is zero and so everywhere in the gyre the input of vorticity by the wind is balanced by linear motion drop. Okay? So there's no need for an interior solution and a boundary solution on the western east. So here already you can, you can see that if you don't have beta, okay, you have a symmetrical gyres. There's no boundary uh, be on the west or the east. So we, what you need is beta. Okay? So you need differential rotation to have this asymmetrical gyre that eventually puts the return flow on the west. Okay? And you know the explanation that it has to be on the west because EV conservation. But actually, we will see that it, it, it is not that way actually. Okay. I mean, it is, but. Not really. I mean, that, that's the uh, that's the um, the way the system works in terms of balancing, but it's not the main reason. Okay. Bear with me a second. And so we get to this uh, solution for the stomach jar. Okay, uh, it's too small to see, but okay. this. Uh, four different solutions of the Stommel model. Okay, you remember there was that parameter, no dimensional parameter, epsilon, and the uh, boundary layer width was proportional to that parameter epsilon. So if you put the parameter epsilon to zero, which was related to the linear drag, then you don't have drag, and so you recover this vector solution. And so if you put epsilon equals zero in the Stommel problem, you recover just the uh, vector solution. Okay, you have the interior transport, and you don't have the boundary solution, which is what we saw right at the beginning, this virtual solution. Then if you start increasing epsilon, which is proportional to the linear drag, then you start forming this boundary layer on the west, larger and larger as you increase linear drag, because we saw that the boundary layer width was proportional to the linear drag. So the larger the drag, the wider the boundary layer. 
and so you can clearly see the uh, the width of the boundary layer that increases as you increase the linear drop length. If you look, so this is the string function. Right? So these are different string lines computed from the string function. If you look at the center of the gyre, okay, so you cut through the middle of the gyre, and you look at the string function and the meridional velocity. You see this, okay? The string function is this, and then it goes to zero, and this is the width of the uh, boundary layer that increases. This boundary layer width increases as you increase epsilon. If you look at the meridional velocity, I should improve my graphics, but if you improve the meridional velocity at the center of the gyre, you see that it's slightly negative because that's this vertical flow going south, and then there's a strong uh, positive meridional velocity. And again, as you change epsilon, the width of the boundary layer, this meridional velocity in the region where it goes from negative, this vertical interior, to positive, the boundary layer, this region increases and the strength of the positive meridional velocity decreases. So basically, all of this meridional velocity positive has to balance all this tiny negative interior velocity. Okay, so if you integrate all this mass transport is equal to the mass transport there in the, in the western boundary. But you see that the meridional velocity as you go to the uh, western wall of the basin doesn't go to zero. Okay. So the meridional velocity at the border of the boundary current is not zero. So this, and now we can look at a different way of looking for the solution for the uh, Windjuren gyres. So Stommel used bottom linear drag, but of course that is not very realistic. The input of vorticity by the wind stress cannot be balanced by bottom drag at the bottom of the ocean. So it's a very good approximation of reality. It gives you a qualitative description of the Windjuren gyre. But it's probably not what you want to use bottom linear drag because that physically is, is not the way it works. So Munch, instead of using uh, bottom linear drag, what he did is to use lateral viscosity. Okay? We saw that we need a boundary current, and we know that it's in the west. And so Munch said instead of balancing the wind driven input of vorticity by the bottom, let's balance the input of vorticity by the wind on a side of the uh, gyre, which is going to be the western side where the boundary current is. So instead of using bottom in the drag, let's use lateral viscosity on the side of the basin. Okay. So he basically changed linear drag to lateral viscosity, which is more Realistic. And so we're going to look at the uh, solution of the Munch model, the Munch problem. So you go back to your geostrophic equations. Okay. Just this. And then you have continuity. And instead of adding bottom linear drag, you add lateral friction. And so the stress tensor is going to look something like this. Yes. So you have some uh, lateral viscosity given by that parameter nu, and then the vertical component, which is what is going to be interesting. Okay, 
right? So now we can, again, vertical integrate, we're going to consider a vertical integrated ocean or homogeneous ocean. Yeah. Integrate the uh, uh, pressure and uh, right bar zero minus h u rho. Yes, that's minus and b. Okay, let's so that vertically integrate our momentum equation. And so we do that minus fb bar, so the vertical integrated meridian velocity. This is supposed to be capital V. Let's take this constant at the viscosity parameter. Continuity that once you integrate it just reduces to this. Okay, so this stress tensor at the surface, we can call it, as usual, tau x and tau y, our stress tensor, and at the top is going to be the dz top minus the dz at bottom. And this is going to be zero because there's not going to be any stress at the bottom, only the stress at the top. So this can be rewritten as now x at the top. This minus. Okay, so we're here, and now we have this horizontal component of the uh, viscosity and the vertical component of the viscosity where we kept only the top contribution because the bottom cell was going to be zero. 
Now do the usual thing, you take the curve of the horizontal momentum equation. So if you take the curve of these two, as we did for Stommel, and then you use the string function definition. So u is minus psi x and v is psi y. Okay, so take the curve, put the string function in, and you will see that so the horizontal contribution of the viscosity term cancels out. And you're left with the uh, curl of this. At the top, what we know is just the Winstress curl at the top. Okay. Plus. So now, if you remember, the Stommel had linear drag here, and Munch ended up with a viscosity coefficient here. Okay. So instead of a linear drag coefficient, we have a viscosity term. And it's for further, so it's biharmonic. Biharmonic turbulent viscosity. Okay, just take the curve of this, substitute the string function, and, and you will see that you will get this. Okay, just the way we did for, for Stumble. So, I'm not going to do exactly the same thing, because otherwise you're going to get extremely bored. But once you get... For this monk model, okay, you can solve as we did for Stoma. Look for interior solution and then look for a boundary correction to match to the interior solution. So you do exactly the same that we did for Stoma. Okay, but now you need more boundary conditions, okay, because of the higher orders. So the first boundary condition is the one that we have for for the interior solution, psi equals zero, okay, is the same that we had in Stommel. The second boundary condition could be, given the expression, the second boundary condition could be either zero vorticity, okay, because of this, okay, and if you choose zero vorticity on the other side of the basin, that means uh, psi by the n squared equals zero, where n is a normal is normal component to the wall. Okay. And uh, x equals zero, so on the western border, this means that dv by the x is equal to zero. Okay, so that means that there is no horizontal shear at the boundary of, of the, the meridional component. So that's one possible solution that is called free slip. Okay, so there's no shear in the meridional velocity. So free slip. The other possible boundary condition is the psi by the n is equal to zero. Okay. And that means that at x equals zero, so on the western side of the basin, v, the meridional velocity, is equal to zero. Okay. If you remember Stommel, the, uh, the profile of the meridional velocity in Stommel was going slightly negative, the interior solution, and then positive balancing. And on the border, V was not zero. Okay, so Stommel was not bringing the meridional component to zero. If we choose this condition, which is no slip, then we can bring the meridional velocity to zero on the other border as well. Okay. So we're going to choose no slip. You could choose free slip, but we're going to choose no slip. So V is going to be zero at the western side. And that's the second boundary condition. Okay. So we're going to have this one, and we're going to have the side by the end is equal to zero. So you do exactly the same that we did for Stommel. You take a simple wind stress pattern, same one. Okay. You no dimensionalize like you did 
stomol, and you get to this expression. If you remember, we had an epsilon for stomol, okay? and now we have an epsilon m for MOC. Okay? And now the expression for epsilon is slightly different, and it's going to be related to the width of the boundary layer in MOC. Okay? You see it's related to the uh, viscosity, okay? beta and L, which is the Rossby. Exactly the same procedure that we did for stomach. The full solution of the stream function of the stream function is going to be the sum of the interior transfer, which is going to be Svejuk. So putting epsilon to zero, this is just going to be Svejuk, plus a correction on the uh, stretched horizontal axis that we did for stomach. So the interior is Svejuk plus the correction where epsilon is not zero, where viscosity is important. So you do, again, the, uh, can you see the mouse? No. Okay, so, on this, with the stretch coordinate, you write this expression, similar to Stomno, different. Leading all the parts is this. You look for the same uh, solutions. The interior's virtual balance is this. You take again C equal one. Okay, same same arguments. And uh, after the procedure, the same procedure of matching the interior solution and the uh, and the uh, boundary layer correction, slightly more algebraically complicated, but you arrive to this expression. not difficult, it's just a couple of pages of algebra. If you look at the terms with epsilon, if you put epsilon equal to zero, of course you recover this virtual material solution. Okay, and if you now take the uh, solution for MOOC, and you plot the stream function in the streamlines again with different values of epsilon. Now it's epsilon m, okay. With epsilon equal to zero, this is just the interior solution, it's virtual. Okay. No viscosity, balancing the width of the curl, so you just have the uh, interior transport towards the equator in this case. Then you start increasing epsilon, and you start forming the boundary layer, okay, which is getting wider and wider as you increase lateral viscosity. Now it's not linear drag, but linear drag is lateral viscosity. As you increase lateral viscosity, you get wider and wider boundary current. So always remember that this boundary current is supposed to be the Gauss stream. If this doesn't excite you, think about the Gauss stream. And if you plot I mean, in the center of the gyre the stream function and the radial velocity, you get again the uh, width of the uh, boundary um, return flow that is getting wider and wider as you increase epsilon. And this is the meridional velocity. So again, slightly negative in the, in the interior. And then this positive meridional flow balancing this mass, that now is going to zero at the western side, okay, because of the boundary conditions that we chose, which is more realistic. Okay. And so all this return flow is balancing the interior transfer. So what is the width of the uh, Munch boundary layer? As we did for Stommel, in the boundary current you have a balance between beta and viscosity, lateral viscosity. Okay. If you do a scale analysis you will get the, the boundary layer width, so L now in the boundary layer is delta, the boundary layer width, okay, that the scale of interest, and that delta is going to be viscosity over beta to the point. So that is giving you the scale of the boundary layer width in, in the Monk model. Okay, so the, uh, the uh, solution for Monk is slightly more realistic because linear drag is not physically uh, plausible lateral viscosity is more realistic. But of course we've been looking at the uh, steady state linear models. Okay? You could take the Lagrangian derivative, not neglecting 
in non-linear terms, not neglecting time dependencies, and get a more accurate representation of the wind driven gyre. And actually you could you could use both solutions and use the uh, fully non-linear Stoman Munk problem. So you could put the linear drag and the lateral viscosity, put the non-linear terms, the phi here, okay, and the time dependencies, and this is going to give you a slight, a even more realistic solution to the uh, to the wind driven chart, but still an approximation. existence of this western boundary currents since a long time, but the, the explanation of the existence of those western boundary currents, like the Gulf Stream or the Kuro Shield, is really dating back to 1950-52. So the, the MOOC model is a paper from the 1951. So it's very recent. But people knew of the existence of the Gulf Stream, even though they couldn't explain it, uh, back in the uh, 18th century. So this is the first map of a curiosity getting out of Jacobians and, uh, and viscosities. This is a map, the first map of the Gulf Stream. This is North America, okay, this is Florida, North America, Canada. And this is the way people thought about the Gulf Stream in the 18th century. It looks like a river, so it looks very linear, it looks very uh, steady. You don't see eddies, filaments, instabilities. Okay? So this will be well explained by the uh, Monk problem. Okay? Steady, uh, linear. And, uh, and so how, how people got to know about the Gulf Stream? So this is the first map of the Gulf, about the Gulf Stream, and it was drafted by Franklin, that later became the president of the United States. And so, why he drew, how he drew this map? So, he was talking to his cousin, Timothy Fogger. So, his cousin was a fisherman. Okay? And um, he, asked, uh, he asked him about this strong current. And um, he said, why, why, do, why do ships take less time uh, What was the story? <laughs> uh, okay, so American fishermen, they were getting to the U.S. faster than, than British uh, ships. Okay? Uh, and I said, why, why, why can, you, can you get to the U.S. faster than, than British ships? And so his cousin, Folger, he told him about this strong warm car. So it's warm again because it's a western boundary current that goes from equatorial regions towards north. So it's bringing warm water towards higher latitudes. And it's very strong, and now we know why it's very strong because it's returning all the interior's virgin transport. Okay? It's relatively narrow. And so Folger, the cousin of uh, Franklin, he told him the story that all the, all the fishermen in the US, in the east coast of the US, they, they know about this current. And so when they sail, they sail in favor of the current, okay, so the current uh, helped them. And when they had to sail back to the US, they don't sail against the current, but they go slightly southward and then cut across, okay, just not to sail against the Gulf Stream. They didn't know why the Gulf Stream was there, but they knew it was there. On the contrary, the uh, British uh, ships, 
they wouldn't listen to the American fishermen because they thought they were much cleverer than Americans. They probably think they are. And, um, and so they were sailing against the Gulf Stream. Right? And so for the, for the British ships, it would take longer to, uh, to reach the, uh, the American coast. And so Franklin drafted this map of the Gulf Stream after his cousin told him roughly how wide it was and where it was flowing and, and the fact that it was warm. So this is the, uh, this is the image of the Gulf Stream that people had for a very long time. But now we know that the Gulf Stream looks much more like this. Okay? This is a satellite image of the Gulf Stream. Warm is, so this is sea surface temperature. Warm is red, blue is cold. And you see this warm western boundary current flying, uh, flying yeah. um, flowing next to the coast, west coast, east coast of America, west coast of Brazil, and then turning and closing the ideal gyre that we have been trying to uh, uh, understand so far. But you see that it's definitely not steady, okay? It breaks into eddies and filaments, highly nonlinear, okay? So if you want to really get an understanding of the Gulf Stream or any Western boundary currents, then you need the nonlinear terms and the time dependence. This, this Gulf Stream fluctuates every day, so it's highly, uh, highly time dependent as well. So, what we had so far was so linear drag, you know, linear drag is not very realistic, and then we used lateral viscosity, which is more realistic, uh, but still we will see that uh, we don't actually need lateral viscosity or friction. So, so far we do, but hopefully at the end of the class we will not need uh, friction that much, just a little bit of friction. Okay? But so far we need friction, okay? and why do we need friction so far? We need friction so far because so this is my no dimensional basin as usual, okay? And you have streamlines. These are the streamlines of the MOOC model, okay? And the boundary layer is Slightly exaggerated. Okay, so this is the MOOC solution that we got. And these are the streamlines, psi what, P1, P2, for example. Okay. So so far with what we know, we need friction. And why do we need friction? Remember this is uh, a homogeneous ocean, okay? Our ocean so far has been homogeneous or vertically integrated. And so far is a flat bottom. So the ocean is flat. The ocean is flat, so vertical velocity at the top, vertical velocity at the bottom are equal to zero. They cancel out once you do uh, all your manipulation of the um, momentum equations. So in these conditions, we need friction somewhere. Bottom in a drag lateral viscosity, we need friction. And there's a simple argument, there's a simple explanation. I don't know if you like it, but I do. So if you take the uh, PV equation for steady, linear, barotropic flow, homogeneous, okay. it stays plus some forcing on the right-hand side. Winston's curl and linear drag at the bottom, or lateral viscosity, or your stress tensors. So this, for a flat bottom and homogeneous ocean, reduces to this. Curl of tau at the top, plus friction. Whatever form of friction you want to use, linear drag, biharmonic viscosity, whatever, something, 
okay? And here Q is, as in the PV equation, okay? So now you can say, okay, I'll, I'll integrate this PV equation for a homogeneous barotropic flow between two string functions, for example, psi y and psi 2. Okay? So I will integrate over some area, A, that is bounded by these two streamlines. This streamline and this streamline. Okay? So I will integrate over this area here. Some area A. And this area integral, you can use the divergence theorem, the two dimensional divergence theorem, and that is going to be so one dA minus. using the divergence theorem. And this is going to be equal to zero. Okay, so the line integral of that flux is going to be equal to zero. So once you integrate the left hand side over an area bounded by two streamlines, you can pick two streamlines, whatever streamlines you like. And if you do the divergence theorem, that is equal to zero. So the flux integrated in that area bounded by two streamlines is equal to zero, which makes sense. Okay. But then look at the right hand side. If you integrate the curl of the wind stress over some area, that doesn't need to be zero. And actually it's not zero. Okay? There is, it doesn't have to be zero. And so if this is not zero, over the area A, then there must be somewhere where friction is not zero in order to balance this area integral that is not zero, because this is zero. So if this area integral is not zero, then friction has to be not zero somewhere in order to balance the uh, Winston's curve integrated over the area. Okay. It doesn't have to be everywhere, but at least somewhere over the area A, friction has to be not zero. Okay. And so you can pick whatever streamlines you like. You can, you can imagine any kind of streamlines that you like. But the, uh, the, the physical point here is that all of the streamlines, they have to pass through the boundary layer delta, where friction is not zero and can balance the Winstress curve. Okay. There cannot be a streamline, two streamlines that close outside of the boundary layer, because if they close outside of the boundary layer, the Winstress curve doesn't have to be zero. But if I'm outside of the boundary layer, by definition, friction has been neglected, and so this is zero. So it cannot be. So the streamlines, they have to go through the boundary layer at some point, where friction is not zero and can balance the Winstress curve. Is, is the argument that we've been saying all the time. There has to be a boundary layer where friction is not negligible, and that friction will balance the input of vorticity by the Winstress curve. And so through this example, you see that all the streamlines, they have to go through the boundary layer. And so once the streamline, imagine the streamline that passes through the boundary layer, where friction is important, and there friction can balance the wind stress curl outside of the boundary layer. So this is not zero here. Then the streamlines go through the boundary layer, where this is not zero, and balances the input of vorticity by the wind stress curl. 
that's why once you compute your simple model, streamlines you know where the boundary layer is because they have to go through the boundary layer. They cannot close outside of the boundary layer. So outside of the boundary layer there's no friction is zero by definition. And if you integrate between the two streamlines, this is not zero. This is zero by definition, so there's no there's no balance. So the boundary layer is going to be here, here, and here by definition. That's my way of thinking about the, the need for friction. The need for friction that we need so far in this model because it is homogeneous and flat bottom. Okay. So then you have the uh, usual argument that, that you probably know. So you know that there is a western boundary current because the western boundary current is the only place where friction, for example, lateral viscosity, can balance the input of what is the by the Wister scale. Okay? So that's the argument that you have been uh, fed so far. So the typical example that we've been doing so far in this very material, subtropical gyre, the wind causes Ekman pumping, so squashing of the water column. And in order to conserve vorticity, it moves the water world so that PV is conserved. So we have this, this, this. This has to be a constant. Okay. This becomes smaller. The whole interior of the ocean is not going to start to rotate. So it's moving towards smaller areas. And so it's moving, it's moving to the south. And how is that balance? The flow wants to return to higher latitude at some point in order to conserve mass. And so there must be some forcing that puts vorticity back into the fluid. So the negative vorticity that was given by the wind stress has to come back somehow. And uh, this cannot be in the form of planetary vorticity, F, because F already balanced the interior flow. And so the input of vorticity has to be given by relative vorticity. This thing here, okay. in the western boundary. So if you consider western boundary in the northern hemisphere, uh, and you put lateral friction like in the moon, in the MOOC model, uh, I'll show you the diagram. You get this diagram that you've probably seen before. Here the input of vorticity is balanced by F, the vorticity. How do you put back vorticity into the system? With a boundary layer on the west. Boundary layer on the west, when you put meridional velocity V equals zero as a MOOC, then it has a shear. And this shear gives you positive relative vorticity. And this positive relative vorticity is balancing the negative input of vorticity by the atmosphere. If you put the return flow on the eastern side, and you put V equals zero as boundary condition MOOC, and this is the shear, and this is um, negative input of vorticity. Same sign as the Winston's curve. Okay? So this cannot balance the change in vorticity in the interior flow, and so this is not a plausible solution, okay? whereas this one is. 
So that's the usual, the usual explanation of why the boundary current is on the west. Actually, the boundary current is not on the west because of friction. Okay? And friction giving you a change in relative vorticity balancing the input of velocity. That friction is the way to put the system into a balance and not the concept of vorticity. But the reason why the boundary current is on the west is a different one. Okay? So, because of what I'm about to say, the boundary current is on the west, and once you put the boundary current on the west, how do you balance the flow? How do you balance vorticity? In this simple ocean, through friction, that generates a change in relative vorticity, balancing the input of vorticity of the user screen. Okay? So friction is the way the system comes into a balance. But it's not the reason why the boundary current is on the west. Once the boundary current is on the west, how do you balance vorticity? Through, uh, through relative vorticity. Okay? Relative vorticity is the, uh, the way of balancing vorticity. It's not the reason why the boundary current is on the west. The reason why boundary current is on the west is because of beta. Again, if you remember this simple diagrams here, This is the F plane, F is a constant, and this is with beta. Okay? So with beta, you have a boundary on the west. And why do you have a boundary on the west? Because if you, if you have beta differential rotation, then you generate something that you should be well familiar with, that is called Rossby waves. Right? So even without thinking about Rossby waves, any disturbance that you generate in the ocean or even in the atmosphere on the beta plane that now we know what it is will start moving westward as a Rossby wave. So imagine this is the uh, your particles, water, air, doesn't matter, a geophysical fluid on a beta plane. This is the initial condition, okay? And if there is a disturbance caused by anything, for example, wind stress blowing of the ocean or some instability in the flow, if a particle is displaced towards the north, in order to conserve PD, it will start rotating clockwise. By rotating clockwise, what it will do, it will push northward this side, and south for this side. So if you have an initial disturbance like this solid blue line, if you start being affected by beta differential rotation, then this initial wave will be moved northward on this side and southward on this other side. So that the crest will move to the west slightly. If you displace a particle to the side, to the south, we will start moving anti-clockwise in order to conserve PD. And what it will do is move this side of the trough to the north and this side of the trough to the south. And so the initial wave will move again towards the west. Okay? And so if there is an initial disturbance caused by anything, whatever you like, on a beta plane, because of differential rotation and conservation of PD, this initial disturbance will start propagating to the west and it will start propagating to the west as a wave and that's the mechanism of a Rossby wave. That's why a gravity wave, what is the uh, restoring mechanism of a gravity wave? Gravity. What is a restoring mechanism for a Rossby wave is planetary vorticity. So this will start oscillating over the initial F latitude and it will start moving westward as a Rossby wave. So if you take a symmetrical gyre on an F plane, where you have your wind stress curl and you have your friction that is balancing everywhere your wind stress curl, and then suddenly you switch on differential rotation beta, what is going to happen? It's going to happen that 
the whole gyre, the whole system, will start traveling to the west as a wave. So basically, the gyre is going to be moving towards the west, given by the differential rotation beta. But it will not travel as a Rossby wave around the globe, because there are continents. So what the gyre will do is it will squash to the west coast. this, okay? So if you start with a symmetrical gyre and then you switch on beta, that beta will generate that Rossby wave mechanism that will try to move the symmetrical gyre to the west as a Rossby wave. But there is a wall here, so the gyre will squash to the western side. And once you have squashed the gyre, the center of the gyre, to the western side, then you have created this boundary layer. And how do you put in balance the input of vorticity in the interior and the boundary layer is through lateral friction here. So lateral friction balances the flow, but it's not the reason why the western boundary current is on the west. The western boundary current is on the west because of beta. If there is no beta, then the center of the gyre is, is in the center. It's a, just a symmetrical gyre, right? like this. You have friction here, but you are on an F plane. So you don't need a boundary layer, because the wind stress curl is balanced everywhere by friction. So friction alone cannot give you the boundary current. Once you switch on beta, then the gyre is squashed to the, way, to the west, because of the westward propagation as a Rossby wave. And then friction is balancing the Winstress curve only within the boundary layer. Okay. So friction is the mechanism to balance the flow. It's not the reason why the boundary curves on the west. So this way of looking at the reason why the boundary curves on the west and not on the east is a bit misleading. Okay. So on the east you cannot balance through, you're going to balance PV through friction. But it's not the reason why the boundary current is on the west. Okay. This is a way of balancing the flow, and you can do it here on the west with this mechanism. But it's not why the boundary current is on the west. So okay. clear? Yes? So, so actually, can think about this. <coughs> so the summary of the models so far, the summary of the models that are homogeneous or vertically integrated and flat bottom. So these two Stommel and Munch simplified models. The models are vertically integrated. The momentum equations are the to stopping equations. And no linearity is neglected to make things simple. And the model is flat, okay? the ocean is flat. How do you balance the input of vorticity by the winds? In the Stommel model, linear drag. In the Munch model, harmonic viscosity. Okay. That's how you balance the flow. That's not why you put the boundary current on the west. What is the solution of these models? The transport in this vertical interior is towards the equator in this inner subtropical gyre. Uh, this vertical transport is balanced exactly by a poleward return current that is on the west because of beta, because of differential rotation. The boundary layer satisfies mass conservation, and it must be a western boundary layer for friction to provide a force opposite inside the interior. Okay. And so, so far, a boundary layer is a frictional boundary layer. We need friction to balance the input of electricity by the system. That's how you balance the flow. The only way we can balance this is friction. The only way we can allow for a return current is through friction. The western location of the boundary current does not depend on the sign of the Coriolis parameter. Okay. So there is a western boundary current in the southern hemisphere as well. 
and it doesn't depend on the sign of the wind stress. We have been looking at a isotropical gyre, and you put the boundary high on the west, but you could look at a subpolar gyre, where the wind stress curl is opposite, and you still put a boundary high on the west. The location only depends on the sign of beta, which is always positive. If you remember the uh, Coronis parameter F goes positive and negative, northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere, but beta is always positive. Okay? D by the Y of F is always positive. And so the return current depends on beta. So on the differential rotation of the Earth. So as an exercise, you could take your equations and change the sign of beta. And you will see that if you change the sign of beta, the return current is on the eastern side. If you let everything the same, with the curl, all your parameters, but you change the sign of beta, then the solution would be a boundary current that is in the east. Okay? So friction is not the reason for the boundary current to be in the west. And why is the boundary current on the east? Because if you switch the sign of beta, Rodley waves are not traveling westwards, but are traveling eastwards. Okay? And so the gyre will be squashed to the eastern side of the basin. You put the boundary current there, and then you have to balance the flow through friction. So the only reason why, the, the, the only thing that the location of the boundary current depends on is the sign of the, doesn't depend on the sign of F, doesn't depend on the sign of the wind stress. You can change the sign of the wind stress, the boundary current will still be on the west. For example, simplification of what the real world is, but these are the main wind-driven gyres, and the thick arrows are the uh, boundary currents that return the flow. Okay? This is what we've been thinking so far. Usually I think well, the Gaussian, we talk about the Gaussian all the time, we're, we're biased. Uh, we should talk about the crew of shear more, but anyway. So subtropical gyre with the western boundary, with the boundary current on the west, is much stronger, Thick arrow, right? But if you go, if you change sign of F, you go on, if you go on the southern hemisphere, you put the boundary current on the west as well. Okay, you can do the same and change the sign of F. You will find that the boundary current is on the west. Atlantic, Pacific, Indian Ocean. Okay, the boundary current is always on the west. If you change sign of F, if you change sign of the Wister's curl, you're not on a tropical gyre, but you are on a subpolar gyre. The boundary current is on the west. Okay, so the return flow, the integral value transport now is to the north, it's not to the south, now it's to the north, and that is balanced by an equatorial transport on the boundary current that is on the west. Okay. So it's on the west even if you change the sign of F, it's on the west even if you change the sign of the Wister's curve, it's on the west because Rossby waves are traveling to the west because of beta. If you change, if, if the earth would not be spinning anti-clockwise around this axis, but clockwise around the axis, the axis. Then beta, beta will be negative, and Rossby waves will be traveling eastwards. And all these gyres will be squashed to the eastern side of the basin. Okay. Isn't that interesting? It don't seem so exciting. I am. It's a simple explanation, it's a very simple explanation, but there is an even better explanation that we will look now at, that is the fact that so far we needed friction to balance the flow, or actually we needed friction in the boundary current to allow for the meridional velocity. Uh, that is returning all the mass that is taking the quarter what in the interior flow. So in order to have this return flow to the north, in this example, we need a friction so far. But what is if the ocean is not flat? If the ocean is not flat, we actually don't need that much friction.
direction. So now suddenly our ocean is not going to be flat. So we're going to have topography. Simple. But topography. So basically we're going to have sloping side walls. So if this is west, this is east, and this is vertical. So we're going to have So the depth of the ocean, imagine this is the interior of the ocean, okay, where we have the uh, Sverdrup interior flow, where you don't need topography anyway, because the Wister's curl is not balanced by linear drag at the bottom. We don't care about the bottom there. But on the western side, where we know the boundary current is, the ocean is definitely not a box. Okay, so let's add a simple topography, which is a sloping side with some depth h that is a function of space. So now the ocean is not going to be flat, as to some topography, and it's going to be stratified. So there is going to be some stratification. It's not homogeneous anymore. Okay, we're not going to go into the details of the stratification, but it's not homogeneous anymore. So what happens to our equation? You remember that when the ocean was flat, vertical velocity at the top and the bottom were zero, and so those terms were cancelling out. And so we had a simplified, simplified set of equations. Now the bottom is not flat anymore, and so the vertical velocity at the bottom is not going to be zero. It's going to be a component that is not zero. So our momentum equations the planet geostrophic equations where it is, okay, the horizontal momentum equation, the pressure gradient and some some portion terms, okay, at the top and at the bottom. If you integrate this over the full column. Now this is going to be vertically integrated. And then I think I've messed up with the uh, I think I messed up with the uh, definition of the bottom anyway. So this, oh yeah, no, maybe this is okay, the elevation from the bottom. We'll see. Okay, which is not, which is not going to cancel out. And so this is the uh, vertical integrated force terms. Now, I don't know if you remember the Leibniz uh, theorem that we saw in GFT. How do you integrate a... Uh, when we did it, we, we saw the uh, time derivative. How you integrate the time derivative of volume? We saw the uh, uh, constant in time or moving with the flow at some velocity. And so we looked at the... Uh, Leibniz rule of differentiation. So if you remember Leibniz, you know that this, okay, we had the d by dt when we were looking at gft. Now it's an allocator. This is equal to This term, so the total plus not into the top minus P B 
Ita Ita Adivat. That's using um, the Leibniz rule of differentiation. The level of this vertical integration is equal to this. But now this is equal to zero. We're not going to look at. We're not going to consider surface elevations, variability. Okay. So this is zero. This is not zero because the bottom is not flat. But eta. So this is eta. But but eta eta top is equal to zero. This is zero, but this is not zero. So this this term is going to be this plus that term. There's a sign, so it's going to be zero. between the pressure gradient and the slope of the topography. Okay. So this is pressure, remember? Okay. So this is the correlation term between the pressure gradient and the slope of the topography, which makes vertical velocity not be zero. And this is called form drag. this integral as zero I don't know how to use H H B oh yeah H B total depth P D Z this is P Z zero minus H minus the integral of H we use minus sign Z D P I D Z There might be some sign errors but this shouldn't be. This is P B H plus yes, plus minus h zero z rho g dz here I've used the other static balance equation and this is p at the bottom h plus we call it e Okay, so I have defined potential energy that is given by the stratification that integral in that form, what you get is this minus this. Oh, 
to check if I've made a sign mistake or whatever. So let's go to the uh, interesting part. So now you see that it's, it's, it's basically the same equations that we had before, but now the bottom is not flat, so that term doesn't cancel out. So we have an extra term. And you see that we have a term that is related to the correlation between the pressure gradient and the, uh, the slope of the bottom. And we have a term here that is the potential energy that is given by the fact that rho is not a constant. Okay. So we have some stratification and we have a correlation between the pressure gradient and, and the slope. Okay. So in order to have a vorticity equation, take the curve, you use the string function again, and you end up with this. If you divide by h, this plus the Cobian of h minus 1. And this is the curl of f over h. Okay. Take the curl, put the string function definition. You can do it, you are right with this expression. Now, if you if you have a flat bottom and an homogeneous ocean, this term goes away. Uh, H is flat, H is a constant. Okay, doesn't depend on X and Y. And so if you do this for the case in which H is a constant, it just reduces to this. This term is zero. And so you have curl of, which is the equation that we had before. So if you use a homogeneous ocean, this is zero. If you use a flat bottom ocean, H is a constant, you can do it. This reduces to the usual balance that we had before. But the ocean is not flat, and the uh, ocean is not homogeneous. So we have this extra term. And this term is called J bar. Sounds a bit like Star Wars. Because it means joint effect of baroclinicity. So the ocean is not homogeneous, but it's baroclinic joint effect of baroclinicity and relief. Relief not in the sense of I have relief, but relief in the sense that there is a topography. Okay. So that is the Jabba term. The extra term that we have because the ocean is not homogeneous and the ocean is not flat. same derivation, but we're going to see in a different way. If you take the curl of that equation, this simply gives you this, okay, B that we know. F is going to be curl of F, vertically integrated, okay. And then we have minus the curl of the form drag okay. 
okay, and the pressure gradient term vanishes. And this is equal to curl of F minus the Jacobian of J eta. Okay. And this term is the bottom pressure. Torque. So it's the torque, okay, because it's the curve, is the torque that is provided by the interaction between the pressure gradient and the slope of the bottom. So the fact that the slope, the fact that the bottom has a slope, that will give you a torque on the flow that will give you rotisity. Uh, if the ocean is, is flat bottom and this term is equal to zero and you recover the usual balance. Okay. So if we take a homogeneous, so let's first remove friction and forcing. Okay. So we're going to remove friction of all the uh, terms that are related to friction and force. So let's imagine a, a notion that is not forced to the surface and that there is no friction. Okay. So this term vanishes and so we are left with this and minus the Jacobian numbers. Okay. So it's frictionless and it's unforced. And this is equivalent to writing So you have a correlation with the uh, with the slope in Azubikas. And uh, okay, so what we did here is uh, so frictionless, frictionless, unforced, and let's say it's also homogeneous. So the uh, that E term is equal to zero. So if this term is equal to zero and there is not force, there's no friction, we have this, but we also have this. Okay. Frictionless and on force, this goes to zero. Homogeneous, so this term is zero, and we're left with these two expressions. Now, especially if you look at this one, let's talk about what that means in a frictionless, unforced, homogeneous flow. So it's unforced. So there is no forcing at the surface, generating a flow. There is no friction. And we arrive at this balance. Okay? This means that there can be a meridional flow if the pressure gradient has a component parallel to topographic contour. So this is not equal to zero. And the meridional flow is driven by the curl of the full drag. So the meridional flow is driven by the curl of the flow drop. Okay? You don't have any forcing, you don't have any friction, but you have this term, which is the curl of the bottom pressure. Okay? So if you have a curl in the bottom pressure, you can generate a meridional flow. You don't need forcing, you don't need friction. So this is telling me that there is a meridional flow, even if the ocean is not forced, simply because of this bottom pressure torque that is generating vorticity. And that allows me to have a meridional flow. 
if I look at this other expression, I see this f over h. And that is a differential equation. And you see from this expression, you see. Psi the string function is a function of this f over h. And actually, the streamlines of psi and these contours f over h, they are the same, because this is equal to 0. So basically, if you think about differential equations, this f over h are the uh, characteristics of that differential equation, right? the solution if you solve the differential equation through the characteristics method, f over h are the characteristics of that differential equation. And so this is called a free mode. Free mode because the ocean is unforced and there's no friction. So there's nothing there that you would think would cause a flow in the ocean. There's no forcing, there's no friction. But the only thing that you need is sloping bottom. That, inter that interacting with the pressure gradient generate a torque. Okay. So this is bottom pressure torque. And this torque can generate a meridian. Where is this flow going? This flow is going, if you look at this differential equation, the characteristics of the solution, so it's giving you the direction, is f over h contour. And so, if you want to think about PV and a simple way of thinking about this, basically, if you think of a water column that is here at time equals zero, and that is flowing down the uh, sloping bottom, okay, H is, in, H is changing, and in order to conserve PV, there will be a meridional flow into the board that is balancing this change in H, right? because of the sloping bottom. So the only thing that you need in order to put the ocean in motion is not forcing or friction, but is this sloping bottom, right? and the interaction between the pressure gradient and the sloping bottom, which is what I'm trying to say. Right, so it will move it will move towards different F in order to conserve H is changing, so it will move meridionally changing F in order to conserve it. So the interaction with the uh, sloping bottom is generating this meridional velocity. And the direction of this meridional velocity is following F over H contour. What are f over h contours is something very simple that can be looked at here. So you take h, the depth of the oceans, you multiply by f. In most of the regions are quasi parallel to latitude circles because f is large there. But close to large topographic features like the Mid Atlantic Ridge, okay? or other places where h is large, the change, so the gradient in topography, this, okay, then you can see that f over h contour is not just f, because h is not small, but it has these this shapes. And if you look at the uh, North Atlantic Ocean or, or North Pacific, you see this f over h contours that are going in this direction following the slope of the continental slope yeah. on this side as well. So very close contours of f over h, so a large gradient of f over h there. So a very strong bottom pressure torque that can generate and sustain a meridional velocity. The bottom pressure torque here is going to be very small, right? but here where the uh, gradient in topography is large, that term can be very large. 
and can sustain a meridian of velocity that is flowing along f over h contours that are those lines. And the, the ocean is not forced, is unforced, is homogeneous, and there's no friction. Okay? But we can sustain a meridian of velocity given by this uh, gradient in topography. And that's why it's called a free mode, because there's, there's no force. Okay. I'll finish in a second. So, in a simpler way, with simpler equation that perhaps is simpler to see, if you go back to the uh, vorticity equation right at the beginning, okay, BB, this vertical derivative of vertical velocity. It used to be zero in a flat ocean. It's not zero anymore because there is topography. And then here the curl of the windstress. Uh, w at the top is equal to zero, okay, because we are considering uh, a flat surface of the ocean. But the bottom is not flat. So we have, this is the curl by the wind that we know. This is the uh, torque by bottom friction. Okay, could be linear drag, it could be the uh, lateral viscosity. And then we have this extra term that is given by this bottom pressure term. This simply this. That is the stretching of the water column. This simple example of stretching the water column and in order to conserve PV, you have to change your F. Okay. So if you go back to the expression of this term, then you have your meridional velocity, you have the uh, torque by the wind stress at the surface, you have the torque by bottom friction or lateral viscosity, whatever you want, stomach or move. And then you have this extra term, okay? That is this. That is the bottom pressure torque in a no flat ocean. If the ocean is flat, we know. So now there's this extra term. And this extra term can sustain, in an unforced frictionless ocean, can sustain a meridian velocity. That is, that is flowing along F over H contours. So what happens? Uh, Now imagine you have a flat ocean, okay, which is what we know so far. If you have a flat ocean, those dashed lines are f over h contours, simply f. Okay. So in a flat ocean, you have you have f contours, okay, and so you have your interior circulation. And then you have to cross F contours. You have to change planetary vorticity. And you can do that only through friction. Right? You have friction and that allows a meridional velocity that is balancing the input of vorticity by the curl 
input to what is the value of curl, in this example, brought you to larger f. How do you change your f again? Instant function. So the only thing that you have is input of authenticity by the curl and input of authenticity by function. What happens if you have sloping walls? If you have sloping bottom in this simple way and you plot f over h contours, you have something like this. These are f over h contours. Okay? So you have your interior circulation. Okay? That is bringing you the water south. And it's crossing f over h contours. Then you have to close the circulation here on the western side. And you have to cross f over h contours. How do you cross f over h contours? Through friction. Okay? Just like in the uh, flat ocean. So you cross f over h contours and you need friction. This is where you need friction. Once you have crossed f over h contours, then you have this term that is allowing you to have meridional velocity flowing along f over h contours and you don't need friction anymore. I think I've messed up totally the diagram and you can't see anything anymore. But the idea is this, okay? In the center of the gyre you, you cross f over h contours and the balance is between the Winster's curl and the earth's vertical. Then how do you return and cross again f over h contours? First, first you have to cross this f over h contours. And the only way you can do it is through friction, which is what we use so far to generate this meridional velocity that is returning the flow. So here the balance, as we know in Storm and Mook, is between this and friction. Okay? What we've seen all these days. But once you have crossed f over h contours, here you have to continue crossing f over h contours all the time. So you need friction all the time in the western boundary current. So that's why it's a frictional boundary current. Here in this f over h contours situation where you have sloping, uh, a sloping western side of the basin, once you have crossed the f over h contours in this region where you need friction, then you don't need to cross f over h, f over h contours anymore. You're just following f over h contours and you close the gyre. Okay? And so you don't need friction anymore. You just need the bottom pressure torque that sustains, that keeps sustaining the meridional velocity along f over h contours. And you can close the gyre. So you don't need friction anymore. So you need a frictional boundary layer only in this region. Then it can be inviscid and flow along f over h contours. Not really. yeah. So the um, Western boundary kind, they don't need to be frictional, okay? All these arguments about friction all the time, uh, this, right? You need friction on the Western side, and that's, you have a Western boundary current because the only way you can change relative vorticities on the west on a frictional boundary layer okay we know that it's not in the west because of friction is on the west because of beta and Rossby waves and you actually don't need friction that much okay because in reality this is a simple model homogeneous and flat bottom but once you start adding a simple topography like sloping bottoms that adds a term that is the bottom pressure torque that can actually generate a meridional velocity you don't need friction to return the flow. Okay? You just need a sloping topography. You need friction a little bit here where you cross f over h contours. But otherwise, the Gaussian can be inviscid. So friction is not that important. It's just a way of closing PV in a simple framework. I'll stop here. I'm sorry. And today I'll give you the uh, notes. 
and down with wind driven gyres. Thank you.